Hello, you are most welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Real Impartation Moment on Tuesday Night Anatomy with Daniel Lockman. Today's section, I quickly run with you the anatomy of the human breast. Now, usually, if we talk about breasts, usually we don't talk about that in males because males, we know that it is rudimentary. But of course, one thing is that there are some males, they have substantial breast tissue, and that is what we call gynecomastia. I'll show you that. And one thing is that, I mean, for whether it's male or female, one thing that I want you to know is that breasts, okay, is a modified apocrine sweat gland. And that is why, yes, we know that it dwells in what we call the superficial fascia only. Yes, it's only a small portion, which we call the axillary tail of pins, which dwells in what we call the deep fascia, penetrate the deep fascia. Okay, so that is, I mean, one thing that we should know. Now, we know that the breast is very important, an important glandular tissue, very, I mean, specialized in what we call secretion or production of milk. Okay. So that is one thing that is very important so that of course the newborn can receive you know good nourishment okay from the mother now one thing that we know is that this breast yes will range from of course the i mean second rib all the way to the sixth rib but one thing is that yes it is that point where it is usually hemispherical because you know in the sexually active reproductive age females we tend to see that yes it's hemispherical or it's something we describe it as being conical in nature. But of course, with time, you know, as one ages, it sucks. Okay, so that it becomes pendulous and then it may, you know, go outside, you know, this anatomical, you know, landmark that we often use to identify it. And so at the end of this section, we should be able to tell a whole story about this breast. Okay, and so without much ado, let's set the ball rolling. So there we are. Now this, I mean, a nice picture showing you the breast tissue. I told you that this is a sexually, you know, active uh, female, yes, productive person. And therefore, it's going to expand all the way from what we call the second rib, okay? Second rib somewhere here, all the way to the first, you know, rib. Okay, that is what we see. Then, of course, the nipple, yes, which does this structure over here, the nipple over here, yes, is located, you know, in what we call the fourth intercostal space. Yes, of course, we know that we call this one the sternum, which the lay person want to call it the breastbone, where it's subcutaneous, the bone over here. Yes, and on either side of this bone, we have these breasts, okay? So we have two breasts over here, okay? And that is, I mean, what we find. But one thing that we find is that, yes, as one ages, yes, then what will happen is that, I mean, these breasts will no longer become hemispherical or no longer be, yes, finely conical. But what will happen is that it will sag, and when it sags, then they extend to go beyond the first, you know, rib, and it also go beyond. I mean, the nipple will not be at the level of what we call the fourth intercostal space. But not only that, even when the breast becomes very heavy, then what will happen is that it may cause, I mean, this, I mean, nipple to go, you know, below what we call the fourth intercostal space. Okay, so that is what we see. Now, one thing that we find is that uh, these are some important things that I want to tell you. The first thing is what we call emesia. My friends, if we talk about emesia, the one with the spelling S over here, the S over here, is when we have complete absence of the breast tissue. Okay, so if you don't have any breast at all alongside the nipple, then we call it emesia. Okay, the S, complete absence. Then the next one is emesia, my friends, with emesia, yes there is i mean absence of the breast tissue but the nipple you know is present okay so that is i mean one thing that we want to know that there's absence of breast tissue but presence of what we call nipple okay that is one thing and then the next one is that there are some people yes they don't have i mean this nipple over here and that is what we call ethelia okay my friends we call this one ethelia okay so that is i mean what we see and then sometimes there could be multiple nipples now, multiple nipples, we find it, yes, I mean, along what you call the milk line. Now, if you look at some animals, like the dog, you see that it's having a lot of, I mean, breasts. You know, we can feed multiple, you know, offsprings at a time. Okay, that is, what, I mean, the area, okay, that is the breast line. 
So, sorry, the milk line. The milk line represents potential areas where breast tissue can develop. And that is why some P individuals, yes, from the mid axillary point all the way, okay, coming this way, from the lateral aspect, go to the groin region medially. That is what we call the milk line. And the milk line, yes, that is where potentially, yes, some, I mean, nipples can also develop over there. And that is what may lead to what we call polythelia, polythelia. My friends, there is another thing which I want to talk about, that is the inverted nipple. Now, inverted nipple is not athelia. Please get to know that. Athelia is, is absence of this nipple. But there are some individuals, they have the nipple, but it's, yes, it is taken in there, okay? It has sunk in there, okay? The sunken, let me say, nipple, okay? And that is what you call the inverted nipple. One of the classic signs of, you know, breast cancer. Yes, it can, yes, be one of the signs of breast cancer because what will happen is that most people having this breast cancer, then this kind of inverted, you know, nipple. Okay, please, that is what you know. And of course, you know, also know that you may also, yes, I mean, if you do that kind of self breast examination, then you could, may see, I mean, experience some kind of hard lump in the breast, which is often, you know, painless. Okay, that is one thing that I want you to know. My friends, I told you that in males, we don't have substantial breasts. But sometimes, in some, I mean, males, you may see that. And that is what we call gynecomasia. And usually, I mean, people, you see a lot of, you know, I mean, prolactin, you know, in their, what do you call it? Um, in their blood, okay? That is what you see. Okay, so that is that one. Okay, so having seen that, now, one thing I want you to, tell, I want you to know is that if you look at i mean if you look at uh, i mean this breast as if you're having the clock clock face then what will happen is that if i divide it into four then i will get four quadrants okay so it means that this represents what we call towards where we have the sternum then i'm going to have what we call the medial quadrant medial quadrant okay and towards where we have i mean the axilla okay the armpit then that becomes the lateral I mean, the lateral part okay so yes if i divide into two then i will have the upper portion of the medial one to be what you call i mean superior or the upper medial quadrant and of course the inferior or the lower medial quadrant okay and then of course if you look at the i mean lateral quadrant lateral portion then what happens is that the lower aspect becomes the lower lateral quadrant and then the upper portion becomes the superior or the upper lateral quadrant my friends if you see it closely you see that the upper lateral quadrant bears a process okay or bears an extension now i told you that the breast tissue lies in what we call the superficial fascia but one thing that we find is that this portion where it's an extension of the lateral superlateral aspect then what will happen is that that portion is what we call the axillary tail or the axillary process which has an eponym that's the axillary tail of spence that's s-p-e-m-c-e -E, someone's name so we begin with capital s okay so that is i mean what we find over here of course one thing that we all know is that yes i've already told you that this is a nipple and there's an area of hyperpigmentation okay and that one is what we call the areola now one thing that we find is that usually what will happen is that this areola okay we don't expect to see what we call sebaceous glands Okay, there's no sebaceous, sorry, we don't expect, I mean, to see, I mean, what we call the uh, hair over there, hair shouldn't grow over there, and then uh, as well as, yes, I just sent over here, there shouldn't be any fat, okay, but sebaceous glands are over there, when these sebaceous glands, they become even a light during pregnancy, during lactation, my friends, those sebaceous, modified sebaceous glands, okay, over there, is what we call the Montgomery tubercles, tubercles of Montgomery, okay, those ones over here, they are in the areola. But one thing is that they are devoid of fat, okay, as well as hair. Usually hair should not grow over here. Okay, so that is, I mean, what we see. Now, if you look at the functional parenchyma of the breast, now one thing I want you to know is that the breast, okay, lies on this muscle over here. And that muscle, which is behind, okay, so it's from the bed of the breast, that muscle, is known as the pectoralis major muscle now for deep to it we have pectoralis minor okay now one thing i want you to know is that this pectoralis major muscle yes the minor you have it fascia and the fascia is called pectoral fascia okay that's one thing i want you to know remember that because this muscle is i mean this fascia is covering this muscle it is a deep fascia actually okay so this is a deep fascia pectoral fascia okay 
the whitish region around this muscle over here, pectoralis major, is pectoral fascia. Okay, that's what I want you to know. Now, the first thing I want you to know is that this guy over here, where is the breast tissue, is highly glandular. So the functional parenchyma yes, essential, I mean glandular. Yes, that's what we see. So it means that we are going to see what you call alveola, okay? And what alveola is that compound alveolar gland going to make this secretion? And my friends, it will go through a duct. Sorry, I mean these are alveola, and these alveola are within what you call the lobus. Okay, so the breast will have lobus, and each sorry, I mean these lobus, yes, some of them will organize themselves so that we get loop. Okay, so the bigger picture. So we, we are going from, I mean the alveola. They are going to make the product and several alveola will form what we call lobu okay they are, or they are in a lobu okay that is what we see and these lobus okay will organize themselves to become what we call lobe now it is known that in the human breast we have about 15 to 20 lobes okay that is one thing that we see 15 to 20 lobes then it makes sense that of course then there should be some kind of tissue okay running through the lobus and loops okay and therefore we have the intralobular and of course the interlobular you know i mean connective tissue okay now one thing that i want you to know is that the tissue over there we have two kinds that i want you to know we have the fibrous tissue and we have the fatty tissue now these regions that you see them to be yellowish in nature rounded structures over here they represent the fatty tissue okay so the you know the breast that is highly you know fatty yes that's the one of the tissues which is i mean surrounded the functional parenchyma of the breast forming the stroma over here part of the stroma and then the other portion is the white stones which are running through these structures over here can you see those ones okay the white stones that we find them over here that one is a fibrous issue and my friend that fibrous issue okay is given a name which is called suspensory ligament suspensory ligament and my friends, the suspension ligament has an L on them, okay? So we call it suspension ligament of Cooper. Now, my friends, this suspension ligament of Cooper is connecting, okay? Or is giving some kind of support to this breast tissue by connecting, okay? I mean, the breast tissue to what we call the pectoral fascia. Okay, that is, I mean, an important thing which you have to know. Okay, so that is that important thing. Good. Now, one thing is that I've told you about the functional parenchyma that, yes, we are going to have this, I mean, alveolar, which, of course, we said that we are going to be made up of what we call comp compound alveolar glands, we're going to make this milk, okay, and then through the myo, you know, epithelial cells around, yes, under the influence of what we call oxytocin, yes, contractions will take place to eject the milk, and when they eject the milk, yes, it will go through the, of course, intralobular into interlobular duct. Then eventually we go through various duct system, the lobar system. Then eventually, one thing I want you to know is that if you are having 15, I mean 20 loops of the breast tissue, then what will happen is that then we are going to have, I mean, each of these loops will have a single duct to convey it. Okay, and that duct is what we call the lactiferous duct. Okay, so that one that I will show you in a magnified image. Yes, we are going to have the lactiferous duct. And at the terminal portion, these lactiferous ducts will, I mean, become dilated, okay, and becomes what we call the alveola of the lactiferous duct, which commonly we call it lactiferous sinuses. And then, of course, yes, it is open to the nipple, okay, for the baby to suckle. Okay, so that is, I mean, one thing I want you to know, okay. So let me just show you this area. Good. So what are we saying? Now, what I'm saying is that we've enlarged this tissue. Now, I told you that the functional parenchyma okay the functional parenchyma is what we call is glandular yes essentially and what type of gland do we have we have what we call compound alveolar gland now look at this this is a lobe this is a lobe within the lobe we have what we call lobus okay smaller ones are called lobus and each lobe will be made up of several okay what we call i mean alveolar you know glands okay so that is what we see and i told you that yes yeah, surrounding it forming the stroma okay we have what we call the fatty stroma okay majority of it with those kind of fighters ones forming the fibrous stroma yes by way of the suspension ligament of cooper okay so that is what we see now what i'm interested in showing you is that these loops i'm talking about within the breast we are going to have about 15 to 20 of these loops 15 to 20 of these loops and I told you that these loops, they are opening into a major duct. 
and the name of that major duct which we've labeled over here as milk duct is called latiferous duct latiferous duct and as we get closer okay as i get to the vicinity of the areola the pigmented area i see that this duct becomes dilated a bit okay this duct becomes a bit dilated and my friends that dilatation over here okay that we find over here or that region which you call the ampulla of the lactiferous duct is also known as lactiferous sinus my friends this lactiferous sinus what it does is that some droplets of milk will be stored over here and not only that it will also allow for the expression of milk by compression so my friends if the i mean if anyone should compress the milk which is stored over here it will cause it to be expressed yes at the nipple over here for potential suckling okay so that is i mean what we see but one thing i want you to know is that this sinus is at the level of the pigmented area which is the areola i told you that in areola what will happen is that especially during lactation during pregnancy then what will happen is that these sebaceous glands they become even enlarged okay and we call them tubercles of montgomery okay so that is i mean one thing that i want you to know so it means that if you go for an exam and they ask you that how many lactiferous that okay are present my friends this is a simple arithmetic correlation is going to be 15 to 20 because you also already have 15 to 20 you know i mean uh, i mean loops again how many lactiferous sinuses or dilatations or ampulla of the lactiferous duct yes there says right before you 15 to 20 okay so that is i mean what you have to know and these guys will open independently okay in pores in on the what you call the nipple yes on the i mean the summit of the nipple okay then they will open over there okay so that is i mean what we find over here now have you seen the breast now the breast is very important yes i mean if you look at it it's going to nourish the newborn and that is why it, its nourishment is also important by way of the actual blood supply okay it's very important now one thing that i want you to know is that I just want you to know i mean those of you who have not visited the video that i've done on the subclavian artery as well as of course the axillary artery yes if you go and visit that video then you'll be able to really understand what we are talking about over here but one thing I want to go straight over here is that this artery is the subclavian artery. Okay, this subclavian artery over here. I mean, what is happening is that as the first part of subclavian artery, yes, I see an artery going downwards, okay, towards the thoracic region. And that artery is what we call the internal, you know, mammary artery, internal mammary artery. Otherwise, what we call the internal thoracic artery, okay. Now, my friends, one thing that we find over here is that this internal thoracic artery gives some branches, which we call them the perforating branches, okay, going to supply, you know, the breast, okay, that is, I mean, one thing that I want you to know. Then the next one is that I go to the axillary artery, so there are some branches of the axillary artery, which are also, you know, giving some supply to what we call the, I mean, the, to the breast, okay, that is, I mean, one thing that we see. Now, one artery that we find over here in the first part of the axillary artery, I see the thoracoacromial artery, or some people call acromial thoracic artery, thoracoacromial artery. So that thoracoacromial artery is yes, also giving some branches to go and supply the breast tissue. My friends, not only that, even the lateral thoracic artery, lateral thoracic artery is also giving some branches, okay, to go and supply. I mean, this, I mean, lateral thoracic artery. But not only that, even this artery which is coming from the second part. Now, you can see that this artery, there's an artery coming all the way this way. Okay. We also have what you call, yes, it's coming from upper, so superior thoracic artery. Those two are the lateral aspects. So lateral thoracic artery, superior thoracic artery, all of them, all these guys are giving some branches to supply the breast tissue. Okay. Even if you look over here, the thoraco, I mean, dorsal artery, yes, may also give some branches. But more importantly, or most importantly, are some branches which are coming. From the posterior intercostal space or from the i mean yes all the way from the intercostal space okay then that artery the arteries which are coming all the way from that side okay is what we call the perforating branches which is going to supply to the anterior aspect they are coming actually from the posterior intercostal you know space 
okay those arteries over there so that is i mean what we find Yes, of course, you may also have some medial intercostal arteries, perforating branches, which are mainly going to come from what you call the musculophrenic artery. Yes, my friends, if you look at the video that I've done on what we call the subclavian artery, talking about all these as well arteries, you'll be able to picture all these ones. But for now, what I want you to know is that, yes, know that some branches are coming from the internal thoracic artery or the internal mammary artery. Yes, not only that, yes, we are also going to have some from the thoracic acromial artery. Yes, we are going to have some from the superior thoracic artery, lateral thoracic. Okay, we are going to have some branches from the thoracic dorsal. Yes, some also coming from what you call the, I mean, the posterior intercostal arteries. Okay, being some kind of anterolateral intercostal perforators. Okay, and then of course, from the medial intercostal perforators, yeah, mainly coming from the musculophrenic. Yes, we are going to supply this breast tissue. So we see that this breast is highly richly supplied with you know oxygenated blood that's the important thing now one thing that i want you to know is that these arteries okay they are company they are corresponding you know veins okay so it means that after they've supplied it then the oxygen poor blood will have to be drained okay back into i mean the venous system eventually into the right atrium of the heart for potential oxygenation later okay so that is an important thing so it means that veins, okay, have their corresponding arteries. But one important thing is that mainly around where the areola is, okay, around where the areola, there's a venous plexus over there so that it can really drain, you know, this breast tissue from the center, okay. And that is why, yes, eventually they will drain into, of course, uh, into the internal thoracic veins, yes, into eventually into the azure veins, yes, eventually going back into the subclavian, into the azure uh, vein, yes, into the subclavian vein, eventually into i mean internal thoracic yes eventually into what you call the i mean the right atrium of the heart for oxygenation so there's a plexus formed around the i mean where the areola is and that is why my friends i will show you that in the lymph and you know this breast is very important so it means that by way of the venous drainage yes it should not be complete and that is why we need robust venous i mean i mean lymphatic drainage system to help drain the breast of you know the lymph okay that is a very important thing and that is why i want to tell you that in what we call the breast i mean when you look at it i mean this same area where we have this venous plexus we also have a sub plexus of sapi my friends sub plexus of sapi now over here i want to show you here now look over here the, around the nipple i'm sorry around where we have the areola the highly pigmented area you see there's another plexus over here which you call a sub lymphatic plexus of sapi and my friends sapi is s-a-p-p-e-y okay of sapi my friends that sapi over here is someone's name so it begins with capital s now, if you look at this over here, then it means that the lymphatic drainage will also be going from the central region over here. You can really drain it from through either side. Okay, so please pay attention over here. There's one important thing which I want you to know over here. And I want to explain some clinical correlation as well over here. My friends, if I look at this one from the sub I mean, lymphatic plexus, then what I see is that you can see that the lymph, okay, now if I divide this breast into those four quadrants that I divided, then what will happen is that in this area where we have the medial quadrant or the medial part over here because related to the stenum, okay, I see some kind of lymph nodes over here. So there are some lymph nodes over here and that is why those lymph nodes are known as parasternal lymph nodes. Or some people may also call it because it's related to what you call the internal thoracic yes, vessels. They also meant want to call them internal thoracic or internal mammary lymph nodes. My friends, those guys, those lymph nodes over here are going to drain the medial side or the medial quadrants of the breast tissue. Okay, that is one thing that you have to know. But my friends, there's still some kind of plexus that is connecting the, the, the right breast to the left breast. And that is why, yes, you know that cancers can spread through, I mean, hematogenous means, and it can also spread through lymphogenous means. And that is why, because there's that kind of plexus forming a connection between the left and right breast, that is why if there's breast carcinoma to one side of the breast, it can spread to the opposite aspect. Okay, so that is one important thing. Okay, now about 20%, okay, of the lymph in the breast, okay, is, I mean, I mean, 
uh, gets drained okay into what we call the parasternal or what we call the internal mammary you know group of lymph nodes okay that is what we see about 20 percent but my friends the medial compartment the lower medial compartment over here or i mean quadrant over here some of them may drain into an area which you call the sub diaphragmatic and then eventually into sub peritoneal you know lymph nodes or lymph flexes okay so that is i mean what we see so there's a small portion is about 20 percent of the i'm sorry five percent of the cases yes may drain okay the lower medial compartment may get drained into what you call the subdiaphragmatic, eventually to the subperitoneal, you know, lymphatic plexus. Okay, so that's what we see. Now, the bulk of the lymph, okay, for is about 75% of them, my friends, they are getting drained eventually into this guy over here, which you call the axillary group of lymph nodes. Axillary group of lymph nodes. Now, my friends, what do you see? You see that the axillary group of lymph nodes, most of them are located, okay, in what we call the upper lateral quadrant, where we have the axillary tail of spence. And that is why the upper lateral quadrant, okay, is the most successful part as far as, you know, I mean, breast cancers are, I mean, are concerned. About 60% of all breast cancer cases, yes, will happen in the upper lateral aspect quadrant of the breast okay that is an important thing and what's the reason because about 75 percent of the lymph is drained into what we call the axillary group of lymph nodes and that is why i want to show you the pathway how is it flowing all the way into what you call yes eventually send it into what you call the subclavian vein so how is it going now my friends if you look at this one closely where i've highlighted okay in yellow now please look here now this one is based on some kind of anatomical relation saying that if you are here you are more anterior now we have those ones now you see that i told you that like forming the breast um, the bed of the breast we have what you call the pectoralis you know muscles okay we have the pectoralis muscle so it means that if i have a lymph node in front or just around where we have the pectoralis I mean, muscles are then they become more anterior as i go more backward they become more posterior okay okay towards the scapular region they become more posterior okay so that's the principle so my friends i have this pectoral lymph nodes pectoral lymph nodes and those ones we call them as uh, sorry anterior as a group of lymph nodes please my friends get to know that the anterior as a group of lymph nodes can also be called pectoral because they are more in front of the pectoral you know major muscle well my friends you may also have what you call the i mean i mean interpectoral nodes over there yes they may also be there okay but i'm interested in the anterior group of lymph nodes more importantly okay that's what we see then i also have the posterior my friends the posterior yes more closer to the scapula so subscapular lymph nodes okay they become the posterior group of lymph nodes okay so that is one thing i want you to know now my friends the anterior yes and then also i want to show you there's another one which i want to show you over here which is the lateral okay the lateral one yes more closer to i mean where the humerus is so we have what we call the humeral okay group of lymph nodes or the lateral group of lymph nodes okay so one what do i have her lateral i have anterior and then of course i have the posterior group of lymph nodes now what do i see anterior yes posterior lateral now what will happen is that all these guys okay they are meeting over here to form what you call the lateral group of lymph sorry to form what you call the central group of the apical portion you see that we have the central group of lymph nodes okay so that is i mean one thing that we have to know now from it being the central i go to apical and then i'll go to what you call subscapular sorry subclavicular okay group of then i'll go to supraclavicular group of lymph nodes then there will be other yes lymph nodes around yes i mean eventually getting into what we call the right lymphatic duct because we know that for the left all happen is that it will be by what we call the thoracic duct okay so it will drain it eventually so let's look at the pathway now my friends one thing that i want you to know is that if i look at the anterior okay this anterior group of lymph nodes please take a close look at it the anterior group of lymph nodes where is it draining to it is going into what we call the central group of lymph now we are going upwards now to, one thing that i have to know we are going upwards so from the we say from what we call the sub areola plexus of sapi the lymph we are carrying it all the way into what we call the anterior so anterior okay group of lymph nodes or the pectoral 
then some of them may also go into what we call the posterior group of lymph nodes okay from the same sub area plexus okay or the subscapular i mean lymph node then from the posterior posterior will drain can you see that look at the pathway it will go into what we call the humeral or lateral group of lymph nodes now from lateral we are going upwards now from the lateral it will have to give you to what we call the central group of lymph nodes so okay so that is i mean one thing that you have to know from lateral to central now sometimes some may become from a delta region too that one too may also be there okay may also drain into what we call the central group of lymph nodes. now from central where are we going to we are going to what we call the apical okay lymph nodes now from apical i go to the infraclavicular lymph nodes now from infraclavicular i'm going to the supraclavicular lymph nodes okay and then of course once i am at the level of supraclavicular then yes with some other contribution limb from other areas they are going to get drained into what we call the right lymphatic duct then eventually into what we call the subclavian you know vein okay so that is i mean one thing that you have to know but i told you that if it's the left one then it will go through the thoracic duct instead of the right lymphatic duct okay so that is an important place i want you to actually know these guys know these guys so much so that yes we you talk about the lymphatic drainage of the breast is very important extremely important now what have you said about the lymphatic yes i've showed you the part we already now one thing is that the lateral quadrants yes what are we saying they will drain into the anterior yes look of the basin five percent medial quadrant i told you yes internal thoracic and i told you that about five percent yes we'll get into what we call the sub i mean the diaphragmatic ventral into the subperitoneal yes that's what we've seen okay so that is i mean that one for you now the last thing i want to talk about i've talked about some pathologies of the breast but the last thing i want to talk about is the pudu orange syndrome pudu orange syndrome okay so that is i mean now one important thing if the lymph that is supposed to drain okay it becomes blocked or the blood venous blood is supposed to be drained becomes blocked then what happen is that yes there will be accumulation of fluid in there and whenever there's that kind of accumulation of fluid then what happen is that there will be that kind of dimpling appearance okay of i mean the breast tissue so you can see a lot of dots on it okay if you can see that one so that kind of appearance okay resulting in that kind of edema okay fluid accumulation in there okay which usually okay has a rapid onset and it progresses very rapidly within weeks up to about three months then you see this kind of i mean becoming very worse okay so that is i mean what we find over here so because it resembles the orange okay because the dimpling appearance how the nipple too will be like and that is what we call pd orange syndrome pd orange syndrome okay so that is i mean one important thing which i want you to know one pathology which you bear in mind all right i hope you find this meeting helpful i'm very grateful for your time this evening have a good night all of you and may the good lord richly bless you amen